So the two stories are, uh, one is um, going out surveying as much diversity in Cerevisiae as well as Paradoxus, the closest relative, uh, from as many locations and ecological niches as possible um, and just look at what the diversity looks like. Is there any population structure? Is there any evidence of human selection on Cerevisiae for fermentation, uh, which Paradoxus shouldn't exhibit because it's never been associated with human activity? And this involved, you know, my group, uh, most a large part Gianni Liddy, a fellow Italian from Perugia who's been with me for 10 years now, but he's now moving to France in the autumn. And then people at the Sanger Center and then various other people around who did various bits of the analysis. And then um, exploiting that variation that we discovered to work out um, certain aspects of the underlying genetics of complex traits, uh, some of them telomeric traits, uh, was done within the lab. And this, uh, again, was driven by Gianni, but also a, a, a PhD who's recently finished and also gone to France. Um, Kanika, a master's student who's gone to Geneva, and I think I'm going to be following to mainland Europe soon because my whole best people have all come in this direction. How many years has been Gianni? Ten. 10 years, yeah, so a long time. It's, it is time for him to yeah, break away and do something. But, um, so um, the story starts uh, with um, this Russian microbiologist, Gennady Naumov, who came to visit before I left the US um, in the late 80s when I was with Jim Haber bringing with him various strains that uh, were not Saccharomyces cerevisiae um, and not Saccharomyces paradoxus and not Saccharomyces bionis, the three species that were known about. And he, by doing crosses within um, the new populations and between, determined new species. And you know, during that time, we described three um, new species. Uh, two of them were limited to the Far East, and uh, this third one, Cariaconus, was limited to South America. Uh, we now know that Cariaconus isn't a new species, it's just a population of Paradoxus, um, but it has several translocations that made it look like a species. Um, and this was about 20 years ago. Um, and then a little over a decade ago, uh, a French postdoc who is also back in France um, and was Gianni's predecessor, wanted to look at the genome organization and evolution on a growth scale that uh, was going on in these species. So when we look at Cerevisiae and Paradoxus, the closest relatives, the genomes are essentially collinear, no rearrangements. Um, one of the Far East species, which is phylogenetically further away, also is collinear, no translocations. Um, this other Far East species, which is closer than Kudryavzevi, has one or two or more translocations. Each isolate seems to be all mixed up. Cariaconus, which is really just paradoxus, has four reciprocal translocations. And the Bionis that we were working with also had four reciprocal translocation. So we worked out that what's going on in terms of gross chromosomal rearrangements uh, bears no relationship to the phylogenetic relationships. And it seems like um, the rearrangements that get fixed in any species occurred in you know, one big burst, they get fixed. And you know, it wasn't really involved in the speciation event um, itself. Um, but, you know, just got fixed in those populations and we're obeying different rules than the simple sequence divergence that was occurring. So when Gianni came to the lab, uh, taking over from Gilles, uh, he came with him connections to the um, culture collection in Perugia that Martini had built up over the years, as well as others. Um, and had lots of colleagues around the world. And so we, he started gathering isolates of these species from as many locations as possible. And we did some sample sequencing. I think we looked at six genes, um, 
spread around the genome, about 10 KB for 40 of the strains, and, and mostly things looked quite um, as expected. Each species was on its own uh, branch. Uh, but one thing that was interesting was that the Paradoxus populations actually fit their geographic locations really well. There was the Far East, there was most of Europe, and then North and South America. So you can see these two karyokonus isolates are really just North and South American Paradoxus by sequence. But um, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, there's no correlation with geography or with niche. So some of these um, isolates, um, so you know, here's a, 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 the lab strain and a French strain and a, a wild strain from an oak tree in Pennsylvania looks just like a West African isolate. Um, some of these are clinical isolates, some of these are from wine, some of them are from sake, some of them are food spoilage. The ones, the, sorry, the, the ones from the, the three or four, the two or three that, that come from Italy there, these are from um, the Perugia collection, uh, and what I don't know, Gianni knows, and I can list that or find out whether these were some. I mean, some of those are like clinical isolates from the hospital there that are set aside. Most of them are wine isolates. Yeah, yeah. You know, so when uh, Bob Mortimer was. Um, well, in Florence, I guess he was making a large collection, and uh, we have some of those as well. You uh, probably know the part of the collection actually that Porcinelli had of the Italian wine yeast in Florence, then, you know, when it appears to be lost and ended up in Martini's collection. So I think yeah. Martini now has the largest. Italian he probably. He probably does. Oh, sure. um, I'm not sure what's happening since he's, uh, yeah, he's retired. retired um, yeah. So it's not. Clear. I know there's some younger people. Um, thing. Yeah, and this year, next year, she's retiring. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, anyways, there was this um, sort of paradoxical difference between Saccharomyces paradoxus, which uh, the phylogeny fits the geography, um, and Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which looks like it's all just mixed up. And the diversity in cerevisiae, which we all as yeast geneticists say is huge and fantastic. You know, a bread strain is very different from a, you know, a, a British ale strain, which is cerevisiae, as opposed to lager strains, which is very different from wine strains, different from sake strains. I mean, they actually, on a global scale, aren't very different from each other compared to different populations of, of Paradoxus as well as different populations of some of the other species. So um, oops. we also noticed um, when we, there were, at one point, I convinced different sequencing groups to sequence one example of each of the species. So we had a reference genome from each. And uh, when we started actually looking at them in a pairwise comparison across the genomes, we noticed um, that between Cerevisiae and Paradoxus, uh, we actually found a region that was nearly identical. It's about 23 kilobases. Uh, and after looking at all the populations, determined that um, a large chunk from Saccharomyces cerevisiae from um, a lab-like strain um, actually integrated into the European population of Paradoxus. So it doesn't exist in North America or Far East, but in the European population, all the Paradoxus contains this piece of um, Cerevisiae. And then we found subsequently other examples of things that have moved from, say, Paradoxus into the European um, Saccharomyces cerevisiae population. So one example of being in the right place at the right time was being on a long trip to Beijing. This is sitting on the Great Wall of China. This is Richard Durbin, who's at the Sanger Center and at the time was one of the directors there. And the Sanger, as well as all the other genome centers, had just finished a human genome and a chimp genome and a gorilla genome and a mouse and one of everything. So what was next? They wanted the next thing to do. And of course, the next thing was going to be many individuals of the same species. And the Thousand Human Genome Project was being designed, uh, but they had no tools available. And he heard me talk about this yeast diversity, and I convinced him that um, if you look at 
enough yeast strains, you will get as many SNP differences between those at one one thousandth the cost. Um, so why not sequence a bunch of yeast? You can develop your informatic tools um, to then use on the Human Genome Project, and then we get to do some interesting yeast things, which is exactly what um, was done. And so we picked uh, 36 Cerevisiae strains and 36 Paradoxa strains from as diverse uh, geography and, and ecological niches as we could. And we also chose them to be good genetically so that we could subsequently do things with them, which has turned out to be a valuable um, thing. And we had, you know, some simple questions like what were the population structures? Did Cerevisiae look domesticated compared to the wild Paradoxus? Um, did we actually see much evidence of this introgression, which would be, you know, equivalent of Neanderthals and Homo sapiens breeding 40,000 um, uh, years ago and have some genetic exchange between them? Or were they really separate species? And the one example we had was a, a, a fluke. And answer the, you know, what the general population would be interested in is, you know, have we had any influence on yeast? evolution. So many people argue there's no point in studying yeast beyond what we all do in terms of understanding biochemistry, cell biology, fundamental things. It would be no good for studies of ecology or evolution because it's a domesticated species. Um, so we wanted to ask that question. Um, and so we sequenced <coughs> them and uh, this is an unrooted phylogenetic tree comparing the whole genomes to each other of the 36 Saccharomyces cerevisiae isolates. And I'll show you that when we look at them in a sliding window across the genomes, we discover um, two types of these yeast strains. One type is our clean lineages, we call them, which look like paradoxus populations that are equidistant from each other across the whole genomes. And then the other half are on these long branches sort of in between, and they we call mosaic strains. So they'll have, you know, 80 kilobases from, so the, the lab strain sitting up here has large amounts from the wine European strain that we talked about, but then it has significant segments from all of the other populations. And it's just a mixture of these um, different populations. And similarly, all of these other strains are like this. So the um, bread strains, and these were isolated from various parts of the world. Although they sort of cluster together here, they're actually quite different from each other, and they're all mosaics, as are um, all of these other strains. And so the previously defined two domestication events, uh, wine and sake, um, which was based on a biased sample of yeasts, um, aren't really domestication events. They are simply sampling two of the populations we had, and now we're discovering other populations. And actually, within these five populations, uh, three quarters of all of the diversity we measured by SNPs are sitting in these five populations. There are missing things that we don't know about, but recently there have been about six or seven other populations of Saccharomyces cerevisiae isolated in China, which uh, will fill out um, this branch once we get our hands on them and can sequence them. So when we compare, uh, oh, we don't need to look at this, when we compare all the diversity of the cerevisiae um, strains that we looked at, and then look at the same scale for Paradoxus, uh, we see that the Cerevisiae diversity is really much less than the Paradoxus and is equivalent to, you know, a single population of Paradoxus. So one um, possibility is that um, Cerevisiae sort of followed us out when we spread around the world. We took one population with us and the diversity we see is a remnant of that um, population. I don't think that's what's um, happened, but um, that is a possibility consistent with what um, we see. Another way to look at population structure is a population genetics tool that just looks at all of the SNP diversity and asks, are they private to a population or shared between populations? And there are four very clean populations in Paradoxus. And in Cerevisiae, you can actually see 
um, some clean populations that are mostly one color or another, and then all of these uh, mosaics, which are mixtures of two or more of these um, groups. And here's just another way to, to look at that. So, um, you know, some of the lab strains, uh, this is one used by the Haber group for, for um, meiotic studies, uh, and it's very related to um, the SK1 strain. If you do pair, you know, sliding window comparisons, you can see there are chunks from one population here and other chunks from a different population. And then there's some strains that have significant segments that come from some unknown population that we haven't discovered yet. That's just another way to look at that. Um, one of the things that you can do with sequencing that you can't do with, say, array CGH, which all of the other groups were doing at the time, uh, comparing yeast strains, is with array CGH, you can't look at the things you don't know about. But with sequencing, you discover new things. And uh, here we know the reference strain of, of Saccharomyces cerevisiae, S288C, is missing certain genes and gene families. And six gene families we knew about, we found in our collection. We also found 38 other gene families that were not known to be in Saccharomyces cerevisiae before. And virtually all of them are subtelomeric and so haven't been assembled yet. And many of them correlate with um, interesting phenotypes like the ability to ferment certain carbon sources um, or uh, be resistant to certain compounds or stress conditions. And so these, this is a huge resource of things still to be tackling. Colleagues in Sweden did uh, phenotypic analysis on all of these strains and they um, actually measured three. They measured lag, growth rate, and um, the maximum density reached for 67 different um, conditions. So they had 201 phenotypes to measure and correlated those by cluster analysis with the genotypes. And um, you actually get a very strong correlation uh, between genotype and phenotype um, globally. Um, and so the two species fall out from each other, which is good. And then the cerevisiae sort of fall into two groups which correlate or correspond to all of the strains sort of on the left half of that phylogenetic tree and all of the strains on the right half of the phylogenetic tree. They have certain properties, phenotypic properties that split them into two groups. So we have an interesting uh, paradox here that the paradoxus strains which have more genetic diversity are phenotypically closer to each other than the cerevisiae strains which have less genetic diversity, but more phenotypic diversity. And I think I have an explanation for that, which I'll come to at the end. So um, we now have a collection of yeast that uh, for cerevisiae covers probably the majority of the genetic diversity that exists out in the world for Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Although like I said, in the last year, there's been new populations um, discovered which we need to look at. We've sequenced these. Um, first pass was just a few X coverage, but most of them have now been sequenced to 50 to 100 X coverage with Illumina at Sanger. So there's very good um, genomes there. Um, and we've done lots of phenotypic uh, analysis. But the, the major conclusion from this was that as humans have used yeast for you know, useful fermentation, um, we haven't actually selected it for anything. We have just taken advantage of the diversity that's there. And what we have done is given it the opportunity to outbreed and create diversity by um, uh, interbreeding different populations together. And I'll show you why I think that's um, the case. So what do we do with this um, diversity? Can we start tackling some um, complex issues. And the first one we wanted to look at was telomere length regulation because we're a telomere lab. We know, and you know from last week's visit from Martin Kupiak, that um, telomere length regulation is controlled by at least 140 or 50 genes. 
Um, some, when knocked out, make them go longer. Some make them go shorter. Uh, but that's you know really crude hitting on a single strain. What's actually out there in the real world? And so we looked at the telomere lengths in our different populations. And these are two uh, paradoxus populations. And we marked the same telomere in two uh, populations to monitor the length of a single telomere so we could follow it in crosses. And we have a population that has very long telomeres, about 50% longer than the lab strain, and a population that's about a third of the length of the lab strain. And you can easily follow these on, on gels. And when we make a cross between the American and European population, and then look at, um, I think this is 84 progeny arrayed here, we can see the European parent, the American parent. These are just arrayed by length, measured by southerns. And the hybrid is intermediate. And then if you look at all the progeny, it's a continuous variation. This is classical polygenic or quantitative traits. Um, if it was a major gene difference, you'd see a step going up um, uh, between you know, whoever inherited the short allele versus the long allele, but this is uh, indicative of many genes involved. And the other thing you can see is that there are many progeny that are shorter or longer than the original parent. So when you make a cross, and this is true for any trait we've looked at, and look at progeny, the variation that comes out is much bigger than the original um, set that you were looking at. So if you wanted to look at, generate diversity for any particular trait, um, just make a cross and classical breeding genetics will give you this um, from different populations of yeast. So we started out with a very crude set of markers, not very many at all, 30, 40 across the genome, so they're very low resolution, yet we were able to map um, intervals that were associated with the length differences. And some of these are things we knew about. So Q80 is a QTL for telomere length. We know that if you knock out Q, um, you get shorter telomeres. The tel telomerase RNA template is a QTL. Um, and then there's one here on chromosome three at this, on this crude graph, you can't tell where it is, but it actually maps to a region that none of the 150 genes that Martin found um, is in that region. So this way of doing things will generate um, new genes that are involved in, in telomere regulation. And one of the things we um, discovered was that the alleles of Q70 and Q80, although they work fine in the two parental populations, um, if you inherit the wrong combination from them, uh, you end up with non-functional Q. So when we took the hybrid, and one way to test whether these QTLs actually are the real genes involved. You do um, uh, knock out one copy or the other in the hybrid hemizygous uh, deletions. And uh, so if you knock out both American copies, this hybrid now looks European. If you knock out both European copies, this hybrid looks American. If you have one Q70 from Europe, Q80 from America, it's fine. But if you have the other combination, it's as if it's Q deleted. And in fact, these cells are essentially Q minus in their phenotypes, despite the fact they have functional Q proteins there. So we know that even for a complex, difficult to assay trait like, well, it's not difficult, but it's time consuming. There's no high throughput way to do telomere length because you have to do southerns. Um, you can find genes um, involved. So. Francisco, when he joined the lab, decided to take all of the clean population, actually all of the strains that were sequenced, and turn them into genetically tractable strains. So he knocked out HO, he put in a barcode for each one, he isolated A and alpha versions, which are sitting in various culture collections, and then set up lots of crosses. And uh, we chose uh, individuals um, from each of the clean populations, which would recapitulate three quarters of the diversity in the species. Turns out the Malaysian strain is partially reproductively isolated, so we left it out from now. And we generated um, six pairwise crosses between these four populations, a set of F1 progeny. 
and we developed uh, PCR um, primers that flanked SNP differences that by high resolution melting curves um, you could distinguish the four. So this is one PCR product over the same region and all four populations are distinguishable. So we could do this robotically and we have three um, machines going all the time to, to do this. Um, and you could see here the, the reference strain S288C coincides with, in this case, um, it must be, well I can't tell which color it is, it looks like it's the Saki strain uh, population in that particular allele. And so we picked um, 200 markers across the genome and this is denser than crossovers when you go through meiosis so this is sufficient to follow any segregation pattern in the F1 progeny and we did 96 segregants from each cross and genotyped them across those and then did phenotypic analysis and we picked 12 phenotypes so this is just an example of uh, paraquat resistance and it's all relative to growth by the reference strain because that was the control in all these measures. And you, here are the original collection of cerevisiae strains which had diversity that ranged from here to here in terms of growth rates. And here are one set of progeny from a single cross between this parent and this parent. And you can see the diversity generated by this one cross um, is almost as great or greater than the original entire population of cerevisiae that we um, had. So within a cross, most of the phenotypic diversity exists. And so for the vast majority of um, every phenotype we looked at, and here's a set of those we did, uh, we saw similar patterns. The hybrid was intermediate, the parents were towards each end, there was always a continuous distribution and there were always progeny that fell outside of the variation that um, were there. And then we could map um, QTLs for this. So this I think is um, heat resistance in different crosses and so um, here is one very strong QTL that is sitting in the subtelomere of one chromosome and it turns out that the West African allele confers sensitivity to heat. So this is from a high temperature um, location, yet the allele it contains gives you sensitivity, not resistance to heat. Um, and so we tested this by um, hemizygous deletion, uh, one or the other. And when you um, delete um, the European um, allele in this case and leaving only the West African one you're sensitive to um, high temperatures. We still don't know what's out there because we haven't assembled that uh, region. It turns out that for all of the phenotypes we've looked at about a quarter of them are in the subtelomeres um, and we think this is probably going to be true for most organisms that um, you start looking at quantitative trait loci. So one of the things that came out which I'm not going to go into too much, is that uh, when you find these QTLs, particularly the ones that go in the wrong direction, the opposite direction than you think they should, they tend to be linked, <coughs> excuse me, to ones that go in the right direction. So you end up with regions that are associated with a phenotype, which are actually composed of two, three, four QTLs, and some of them um, go in opposite directions to what you expect based on what the parent is, as if they're um, counterbalancing each other. So you get a mutation that gives you high resistance um, to some condition, and uh, quickly in that population you get a mutation that's linked to it that goes in the opposite direction to sort of um, keep things in balance. Don't understand why that is. Well, so this was um, 40 degrees, but then you can go up to 45, 46 and still get um, things going. So I did, don't know if we've pushed these um, that much. So we didn't say take the clinical isis, which grow at 45 to do this, but um, we certainly have strains that, you know, that came out of this that will grow at 45. Well, a very naive question. Did you find, since you got the collected all these strains from around the world, did you find correlation to the temperature of the environment? Nope. To nope. 
um, which is very strange, which is what's coming out here. A lot of, you know, uh, well, I'll show you in a minute that um, I think I have a graph of that, that when we, um, in our, you know, next generation of doing this, we could map 21 QTLs for heat resistance down to the genes, and a third of them go in the wrong direction. You know, so um, it's quite um, remarkable how um, much things are not the way we would expect them. So this is a complexity that uh, certainly for, say, human diseases are going to make things difficult. And breeding experiments in, in crop plants and animals will make things difficult. It, things are not additive and not simple. Um, so what we found with this you know, first generation of QTL mapping looking at um, F1 progeny uh, and comparing the two species is that uh, we have a much more diversity phenotypically in cerevisia, yet less genetic diversity overall. That when you make a cross, um, the variation in the F1s is wider than the parental population. That's called transgressive phenotypic variation. You get more greater extremes. There are incompatibilities that come about which are not additive. And we get lots of QTLs that go in the opposite direction than what you expect based on the niches they came from or what the original parents look like. And in many cases, these combinations of um, antagonistic and the appropriate direction QTLs are linked together. And one question is why? And I don't have the answer, but I have a hypothesis that I'll be working on in the future, which is that in nature, um, you have populations that are separate from each other that are evolving to adapt to their particular niches. And like telomere length, we know there's 150 genes that could be involved in this. And so in this population, you know, maybe there's 150 genes that are involved in um, heat resistance. So in this temperate zone, you need to adapt to certain times of the year that have exposed to high temperature. And you get a mutation in a gene that helps you get that way. But it also has um, a cost to it. So you have a compensatory mutation that sort of counteracts that so it doesn't cost as much. And those things tend to be linked so that sex and sexual recombination doesn't break that apart, that, so it's co-adapted. This population over here does the same thing. But the first mutation is one of the other 150 genes, and its compensatory mutations are linked to it. So when you bring those two together, you get two um, sort of super QTLs in different locations, which are composed of linked antagonistic QTLs. And this could explain a lot of um, what's seen in you know, natural adaptation situations where people have started looking at what is underneath that, and also could explain the huge phenotypic diversity you see in cerevisiae versus paradoxus. So paradoxus has not had the opportunity to interbreed. Those populations are separate. I bet if we brought them together, we would see this. Cerevisiae, by our activity moving the strains around the world, has um, outbred and generated, broken up these co-adapted gene complexes, which produce uh, much more extreme variation in the phenotypes. So um, F1s have problems. One is resolution. Uh, the QTL regions that you map are still contain 10 to 20 genes, because you only have the level of meiosis that you know, breaks down the, the linkage groups. And so there's one meiosis crossover every 150 KB or so. Um, and so that's not enough to um, narrow down, even though if you have a large collection of, of segregants. So what Gianni did is uh, did a little trick where he could continuously uh, cycle um, these progeny through as many rounds of interbreeding as he wanted to. And we went up as high as an F18. Um, uh, but we did the analysis at F6 and F, F12, and F12 was certainly enough. 
And so by the time you go through uh, F12, you now have broken up the linkage groups tremendously. And so in this population here, um, if you have, I mean, I think we started with uh, 10 to the ninth individual spores at this stage to do the next step. Virtually every one of those is a different genotype because of the amount of recombination that's gone on. So the experiment done with the Sanger Institute again was to take these F12 generation, which had 10 to the ninth different genotypes generated from a single cross, which had huge variation in uh, resistance to heat, and then apply selection. So we threw them on plates um, and looked at uh, what grew at different time points, 24, 48, 72 hours. These were arrayed on plates, so at no time was one clone taking over the whole population if it happened to be really uh, resistant. And then we sequenced these to high coverage um, and compared it to uh, the sequence uh, of them grown at um, 23 degrees, actually, not 30, so that there you know, hopefully wouldn't have been any differential growth uh, due to temperature. And when we did this, um, so this is just an example at F6, um, the original unselected pool all across the genome, I think this is just one chromosome shown here, it's roughly 50% of the two alleles that are there. There's a little bit of variation uh, because there are QTLs involved in sporulation efficiency and mating efficiency, and where things reduce, there might have been <clears throat> an allele that was less efficient at sporulation. But then after selection, you can see huge changes in certain regions. And we were able to map 21 QTLs um, that had significant changes in uh, frequency. And some of them reached fixation, so the West African allele was gone um, for those QTLs that were carrying sensitivity. And in most of those cases, it was down to a single gene. And in many of those, it was down to part of that gene where there were only two or three SNPs. And so we knew exactly which amino acid changes were causing um, heat sensitivity or heat resistance. And in fact, um, I don't think I have it here. That was a, that's a shame. Um, eight or nine of these 20 fit into the RAS signaling pathway and affect cyclic AMP levels. And it turns out, and the West African population at high temperatures, a pair of proteins are no longer functional. They're essentially TS. You get elevated levels of cyclic AMP, and um, there's a whole cascade of things that make them sensitive to, to heat. Um, and so this whole thing led us to a pathway that we tested and showed that <coughs> was involved in heat sensitivity and heat resistant, all in a single experiment that cost I don't know, I think each sequencing run was a thousand euros. Um, and, you know, so we did it in replica, but you could, 2,000 euros to get 21 QTLs um, from one experiment as opposed to the um, entire PhD for the six crosses in the F1 to get five or six QTLs for the same phenotype uh, for a student. And, um, so it's very efficient and very high resolution. So, of course, a single cross between two parents doesn't have all of the diversity in um, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, nor does it allow you, the structure of the populations doesn't allow you to do um, association studies. So in humans, you can't do controlled breeding, but you can do genome-wide association. So you look for SNPs that are associated with a particular phenotype or trait, a disease state. And the only way that works is if it's truly an outbred population without much linkage disequilibrium between things. And so in different model organisms, uh, they're trying to take what essentially are inbred lines in mice or inbred cultivars in Arabidopsis or other plants, or in our case, um, populations of yeast, which mostly propagate asexually vegetatively, um, and there isn't really much recombination breaking things up, and create um, an artificial outbred population. So in mice, there's been this effort to take eight inbred lines and generate um, 
mosaic genomes where the linkage has been broken up. In Arabidopsis, the same uh, sort of thing has been done, and I think there's a hundred uh, different lines now established that are uh, mosaics of a set of cultivars in the beginning. And we have taken the four populations of Cervicii to essentially do the same thing. And uh, we have it set up so we can look at haploids and diploids. And so... Um, the Use the display hands. Hmm? Use the display hands. By hands? Yeah, I mean... Um, so the, the, so what, um, the trick is we have Euro3 and Lice2 at the same location, um, and the HO is knocked out, so you can um, very cleanly um, select for spores that are one or the other. Uh, it's on plates. I mean, so um, you can force the mating, in, and you can just keep going, and it's very clean. You know, every colony you pick is a haploid if you want it to be, or a diploid if you want it to be, you know, for the 500 or so that are picked to check each time. But it's been working very well. The mating is to do it one by one. No, no, so we do that in mass oh. and then plate it out oh. and select. Yeah, no, sorry, it's, done, it's not done one by one because uh, that'd yeah, just yeah. be too, too much. Too, too much. Yeah. However, I mean, we have taken this F18 population and um, they have taken 192 A's and 192 alphas, and they've sequenced the whole genomes, and they've set up the 192 by 192 cross to then uh, phenotype those, which that's now Gianni's work that he's taking with him, and good luck to him, because uh, <laughs> that's a lot of um, things to keep, keep track of. So um, you can monitor the allele frequencies of the four populations. So this is before selection using the same thing, and pretty much, you know, it's a quarter, a quarter, a quarter. And then um, when you look at the phenotypic diversity that exists in the population, it's much greater than any of the six pairwise crosses we've done. So we've increased the diversity even more by including all four strains. And then you can apply, uh, oh, this is just other things. Then you can apply the same selection experiment and um, essentially you get um, exactly the same QTLs coming out as before. And now you can start, because you have different populations involved in different alleles, you can start asking questions about whether they're dominant recessive um, and how they're interacting with um, um, other alleles. So, I mean, in, you know, here's a case where one allele is, um, reduced from West Africa and only the Saki allele is increasing and the other is staying the same and others where it's only one of the alleles is reduced and all the others go up or one is a, has an advantage and the others stay the same. So you can see what's, what's going on um, on a much more global scale. Um, so, you know, at the moment there's this huge diverse population that you can apply any selection to that you want to find a strain that's good at whatever, producing ethanol, uh, making some compound, being resistant to heat or an uh, inhibitor, um, of which we're going to be doing. And then you can instantly work out what the underlying genetics are because we've sequenced them all and it's easy to just um, uh, either sequence or take the markers we have and mark um, which ones they are. So what we've um, hopefully done there's two ways that the world is out there mapping complex traits. Um, one is by linkage, like we have just described, and one is by population associations. Um, so this is what's done in humans, and this is what's done in agricultural organisms and now in yeast. Um, but hopefully we've now sort of um, made yeast uh, not only good at this side, but you know, perhaps be able to do the association studies. And we'll have to incorporate the new populations that have been found um, soon in this. So, you know, we've gone from a culture of yeast to hopefully explain a bit of yeast uh, culture and the diversity in generating that. And these are uh, the funders and the people. So Gianni um, is the main player there. Francisco also did a tremendous amount. And this is our lab retreat a couple of years ago in Amelia, north of Rome. So, 
we come to Italy as well. <laughs> Thank you.